Hello, my name is Ran, and this is the Flow Artist Podcast. Every episode, we interview inspiring movers, thinkers, and teachers about how they find their flow and much, much more. If you teach or practice yoga, movement, or meditation, then this is the podcast for you. I hope you're having an absolutely wonderful day so far. I'm going great, and I am absolutely excited to be bringing this episode out for you today. Now, normally we bring out this podcast once a fortnight, but we've accumulated a backlog of great interviews, and a couple of them are a little bit time-sensitive. So I just wanted to get them out as soon as I could. And here we are. This episode is a recorded conversation between myself, co-host Joe Stewart and Paul Majewski. Paul Majewski is a Melbourne-based meditation teacher, the director of Meditation Solutions and the vice president of Meditation Australia, Australia's peak body for meditation teachers. Paul has a really long history of both practicing and teaching meditation, having taught for well over 20 years. It was a great opportunity for us to catch up with him and ask all our burning questions about meditation. Now, I do have a little bit of a confession to make. Normally, I'm a bit more prepared, but on the day of our interview, I had not charged the recorder. The meter on its screen had said it was fully charged, but unfortunately, About 40 minutes into the interview, I realized with utter horror that the battery had run flat. Now, Paul was extremely generous and answered some of our questions for the second time, and I just wanted to acknowledge that and thank him so much for his patience. Now, just before we start the conversation, I just wanted to ask if you could help the podcast out, help Joe and myself out by sharing our episode or the podcast on social media. So Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Google+. No, maybe not Google+. It all helps us get the word out there. All right, that is enough from me. Let's hear from Paul. (laughs) (laughs) Round two. All right, and I'm going to be watching this. So thanks so much. And oh my God, I'm so sorry for for, uh, joining us today, Paul. Uh, Perhaps you could start, just give us a little bit about your background and where you grew up. Yeah, sure. Well, now, because it's the second time around, I can can make up something else. (laughs) I was born and raised in Perth. Both my parents were Polish and they came to Australia after World War II, so they arrived in 1950. So I was born in Perth. I went to a Catholic school for the the whole of my upbringing, but somewhere around the age of 15, I stopped believing that there was a guy with a beard and long (laughs) flowing robes in the sky. And so I kind of stopped being a Catholic, but then having been raised with a particular code of living, it did create a bit of uncertainty in my mind as to what values I was going to have in my life. And so when I was at university, I did a very interesting essay topic, which was around the decline of Christian belief in Europe in the 19th century as a result of Darwin's theories mostly and so I got very interested in religion at that time and I looked at a whole lot of different Christian heresies, I looked at Buddhism, Hinduism, Zoroastrianism, pretty much everything Mm. and I think what I was looking for was something that was a good fit for me, something, a kind of philosophy, way of life that matched the way that I felt about things. And so the one that I found most appealing was Buddhism. So I started to explore that. And the first place I went was a Tibetan Buddhist association. They had a short course and I found that while I agreed with some of what was being taught, there were a few other things that I didn't agree with, particularly the teaching around anger being completely destructive and not good for anything. Uh, However, there was a Tibetan Buddhist monk at the course who was very 
calm and very joyful. And at that stage of my life, that's exactly what I was looking for because I was quite unwell and probably had uh, at least some level of anxiety and depression as well as a digestive illness. So the next experiment was to do a summer school program with Eric Harrison, the director of the Perth Meditation Centre. And I really liked Eric's approach where he regarded meditation more as a skill than a particular religious or philosophical path in itself. And so I did quite a few courses with Eric and then after about two years of meditating on this more casual basis, maybe once a week, I went to Thailand and did retreats in temples there for three months. And at the end of those three months, I was happier and more energetic than I had ever felt in my life before. Did you have this feeling of, this is my path, this is what I'm going to do? Or did it just kind of evolve into you becoming a meditation teacher from there? When I went to Thailand, I had no concept whatsoever of becoming a meditation teacher. All I wanted to do was practice meditation more intensively and see what happened, you know, because I knew that meditation on a small scale made me feel better. So from the point, say, before the meditation and how I felt after the meditation, there was a noticeable improvement for me. And so I thought, okay, well, if that happens in 20 minutes, what would it be like if I did that for days on end? It was only at the end of the two retreats that I did at the first temple I stayed at when the man who was acting as a go-between between between the abbot of the monastery and all the different international meditators who were there doing a retreat, when he suggested to me that I might like to train as an instructor, that was the first idea that I had. maybe this is something that I could do. You know, I could actually teach other people how to meditate. And so I'd love it if you talked a little bit about your teaching approach now. Like, what do you say in your first session when someone's wondering what meditation is? And So the the most important thing, as I see it, is to invite people to see meditation as a very broad field where... It's something that we've all done in one form or another without probably calling it meditation. But if we've ever had an experience that arises naturally and spontaneously of feeling calm, well-focused, peaceful, to kind of inquire into that experience and just ask, well, maybe that was meditation. You know, maybe... The time when I just sat under a tree and felt the breeze on my face, maybe that was meditation. You mentioned uh, Eric Harrison being one of your key teachers, and I really enjoyed his book, Foundation of Mindfulness. I've read that in some Buddhist commentators feel that mindfulness without the sort of religious underpinnings make it not as powerful or effective practice in many ways and I just wanted to know if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, so my own view is that a lot of Buddhists want to run what I might call the purity argument with mindfulness where they'll say, no, Buddhist mindfulness is better than secular mindfulness. My own thinking is that Buddhist teachers shouldn't be worried about secular mindfulness because it's actually paving the way in their direction. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if people practice mindfulness in a secular way and they find it beneficial and they take an interest in it, surely their next question is going to be, where did this stuff come from? Mm. And who are the experts in this field? And so that's going to lead them straight to Buddhism. So uh, it's, yeah, uh, I think it's a bit short-sighted for Buddhist teachers to regard the mindfulness movement as an enemy. 
And what about mindfulness in a corporate setting? Because often it's kind of promoted with goals like stress reduction or it's going to make you more focused or more creative. So it's almost using mindfulness as a productivity tool. Yes. So for a lot of people, it does work that way. You know, a lot of people will do a lunchtime session and then the next week they'll report back and say, oh yeah, after the meditation session, I went back and I was really focused. I got a lot of work done. And so that can happen for a lot of people. But maybe just as many people will say, oh, I felt really sleepy and I just wanted to go home. (laughs) (laughs) The other thing that can happen is sometimes people, because mindfulness meditation derives from Vipassana or insight meditation, which is about seeing clearly and seeing deeply. So it's a case of careful what you wish for. Sometimes if someone in the workplace becomes more mindful, it means they can see more clearly what's happening with the power dynamics in their workplace. And if they're in a toxic workplace full of bullying, harassment, etc., then they'll see more clearly that that's going on and they'll make the wise decision to either try to change the culture or leave. We were talking earlier, you mentioned that there was a little bit of confusion or any strict definition around the word mindfulness itself. Perhaps you'd like to talk about that? I guess what we have is a lack of clarity about the definition. There are plenty of people who are doing research into mindfulness, especially the effects of the mindfulness-based stress reduction program, which is an eight-week program, two and a half hours per class plus a half day or full day of practice within that. And often those teachers will rely upon a definition uh, which comes from John Kabat-Zinn about meditation being a way of paying attention on purpose, without judgment, etc. Now, John Kabat-Zinn has said that that was never meant to be a definition of mindfulness. And you'll find among the researchers various definitions of what mindfulness is. If you look at where it derives from, it's the word sati in the Pali scriptures, so the Theravadan Buddhist canon. And the simple one-word definition of sati is attention. Then there's a whole lot of loading of that word, which from the Buddhist point of view, might contain a a strong moral or ethical loading. So that also brings in notions of memory and a way of considering the consequences of your actions before you take that action. I'm wondering if you feel that because there's this confusion around the term mindfulness, whether it's affected the way that it is taught and transmitted to particularly new people or or it's even spread around the culture, which has sort of created some misconceptions? Yeah, well, I guess it's fair to say that if, if there are a number of schools of thought about what meditation is, then this question of, well, which particular school of thought, you know, which transmission is someone going to get? Are they going to get the Theravadan Buddhist idea of what mindfulness is? Or are they going to get the Zen view of mindfulness, which is a bit different from the Theravadan view? So a lot of people will think of Buddhism as a kind of monoculture. You know, there's either you're Buddhist or you're not, and there's only one kind of Buddhism, where in fact there's actually hundreds of different kinds of Buddhism. So... I guess it's like anything, you look a bit deeper and it's actually a lot more complicated than it looks at first. I guess to flow on from that, if maybe people have tried a meditation class or a meditation technique and feel like it hasn't really worked for them, just keep trying different techniques because there's so many out there and you may find one that links up with how your brain works in a more easy way flow. Yeah, I think that's really important just to recognize that that different practices suit different people at different times and the fact that versatility is important. So we we don't just need 
depth in meditation, we also need breadth. So yeah, you need both of those. And so what about for the people who can't meditate because their brains are too busy? (laughs) Because I've heard that one a few times. I think you just need to find the right doorway. So what we're seeing in the last five or ten years is there's a real growth in music meditation, not just here in Melbourne but around the world. And so what that does is use a vehicle, if you like, music, something that a lot of people really enjoy, and that becomes a doorway, an entry point for people. So they just have to lie down and give high-quality attention to the music. And that's absolutely a, a meditation practice. And so for a lot of people, that will hold their attention. But being told to focus on their breath is not going to work for everybody. A lot of people don't want to focus on the breath. A lot of people find it difficult to stay with the breath. So, yeah, it's just not the right choice for that person at that time. And so, um, speaking of music, <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard around the traps that you actually played in a, a lot of bands over the years. Perhaps you'd like to talk about that? In Perth, I played in three punk bands. Oh, nice. I, I actually played in, in a thrash metal band for a number of years <laughs> back in the day. So, yeah, seemed to have changed in temperament since then. <laughs> <laughs> and so did you have any of those transcendent being present moments on stage? Like, did you experience meditation through your own music? Well, the first two bands I was in, I wasn't into meditation at that time. So what I experienced was being nervous about playing the wrong thing. And so that was kind of almost the dominant kind of emotional or psychological experience of that time. But the last band I was in was after I'd learned meditation and I was able to enjoy that a lot more because I wasn't so focused on my own playing. I was able to look out and see what the crowd was doing and uh, I enjoyed the experience a lot more. And what about the creativity side? Like, Did you write songs and create your own music as well? Yeah, I did and that was definitely a big part of the fun. Uh, And for me, it was a way of getting my ideas out there, you know, like I wasn't, you know, I was never a highly skilled musician, but I did like writing songs and, and, yeah, getting my ideas out there. Do you think your songwriting brain has now evolved into your meditation (laughs) (laughs) leading brain, like that same sense of narrative flow and lyricism? I don't know, maybe. I, I sort of remember a few times you know, back when I was playing in bands, you know, you'd sometimes have these moments where you're just playing and everything is just going absolutely you know, beautifully and it's almost like time slows down and just an amazing experience. I just wonder if you, you're nodding your head, so I'm assuming you've encountered that sort of thing before. Yeah, well, I think it's uh, you know this idea of flow states, mm-hmm. of just being in the moment and yeah everything's flowing smoothly and it's just a very pleasurable experience and there's some sense of time slowing down enough for you to be able to savour the richness of Mm. that experience and then enjoy it even more. I feel like as well there's a sense of that thing that you've practiced and you've drilled it's like the practice gets you to that point where your body knows what to do and it all just flows. So I guess I'm thinking about a correlation between doing your meditation practice on the days when it's feeling like a bit of a struggle and you get to the end of the session and you're like, was there any actual meditation in that? (laughs) Or was it all just effort trying to meditate? And how even those practice times can contribute to getting you to that point where it is a bit more effortless and it does flow a little bit more. So yeah, I guess my question is just about the importance of practice for the benefits you feel at the time and then for the longer term benefits that build over time. Yeah, I think there's something to be said for this idea of not judging the meditation. So if you've done your, say, 20 minutes 
and you think, oh yeah, God, I don't think I was focused for even three seconds out of that 20 minutes. Well, I would contend that yes, you were focused, it's just that your focus changed quite a lot in that time. So you might have started focusing on the breath, but then you realised that your thoughts were actually a lot more compelling than the breath, so you put your focus there for a while. Or you recognise that you were putting obstacles in your own way. You know, that realisation is valuable. So that's a good use of your time. So it's really hard to say at the end of a meditation, oh, that was a waste of time, you know, because it's not true. You're developing your understanding, developing your experience as you go along. And you could say it's a bit like a musician learning scales. You know, the actual experience might not be that fulfilling in itself, but it might lead to an experience that's more rewarding in the future. Um, my, what I sometimes tell myself and my students as well is, if you've had one of those days where it's just been 20 minutes of your brain unloading and unwinding, I almost think of it as like, well, maybe my brain just needed that time to declutter. And so having given myself that space where there wasn't anything else going on, you could just let those thoughts unwind and declutter, then the rest of the afternoon goes more smoothly and you've kind of had a little bit of space and a little bit of perspective. So sometimes the benefits are not immediately apparent on your meditation cushion, but you feel them in the rest of your life as well yeah, after sure. that practice. It's like, yeah. almost like you've defragged your hard drive. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd agree completely. I mean, a large part of it comes back to our own expectations. So we have a preconceived idea about what a good meditation looks like or feels like. So if my idea is I'm going to sit really calmly and get really concentrated and feel joyful... Well, that might happen and it might be great, but I might not learn anything, you know, whereas if I notice that my mind has gone off to a particular thing 10 times, then it might occur to me, oh, my gee, if that's happened 10 times in 20 minutes, imagine how often I'm thinking about this in a day or in a week. So I've learned something. So which meditation was more valuable? And so what do you think about approaching your meditation practice with kind of a practical goal-orientated state of mind rather than with a floaty kind of <laughs> esoteric goal for your practice? I think it's reasonable to say that most of the time our behaviour is goal-directed and I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. And I think a lot of people's reason for meditating, their motivation is something in particular and I don't have a problem with that either I think it's a good thing you know if people meditate because they're having trouble sleeping and they want to sleep better that's a, a good motivation a wholesome motivation I think there is over time a certain unfolding that happens in meditation practice so a meditation practice develops or evolves over time but I don't think you have to set yourself a goal of no goal in order to meditate and have a good experience. I think as well sometimes it's easier to prioritise something like say meditation and we've done this me and Ryan if like it's a really busy work week ahead so we're like right we're going to just be extra onto it this week and set the alarm 15 minutes earlier and we're going to meditate every day because it's just going to help with what will already be a busy and a hectic week as opposed to oh I'm just going to put aside some time for my spiritual growth because that will always just get crossed off the list because there's all these practical things that you need to attend to first so if your meditation practice is kind of part of the practical structure of your life, it's something that you're more likely to make time for rather than if it's a bit more of an undefined, I don't know, something that's somehow separate from the rest of your life because it's your spiritual practice. Yeah, I, I think people have all sorts of reasons for meditating and I think most of those are good reasons. And so having a certain motivation a certain aim might be a better way of staying on track than having no aim. I think as well it is also really helpful for me personally to stay on track 
to not have to find the time every day to like build that time into your day so you don't have to think about oh when will I fit meditation in it's just like yes it's scheduled it's happening yeah yeah so uh, you could say uh, having ritual or discipline is a way of helping you to maintain your practice and that ritual might be putting time in your diary saying okay this is my meditation time I'm giving it priority I'm sticking to it you could also use opportunism so just asking yourself, when can I meditate? Can I meditate now? I was waiting for someone, they're late, I'll just meditate while I'm waiting. You know, those kinds of things. So I think with those two strategies, uh, ritual and discipline and opportunism, you give yourself the best chance of maintaining a, a regular practice. And one really good tip, a really great time to meditate is those times when you wake up in the middle of the night and can't back, get back to sleep. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, I mean... It's uh, an experience that a lot of people have and often there's panic attached to it because people think into the future, oh God, if I don't get any sleep tonight, I'm not going to be able to function tomorrow. How am I going to do it? And so that just revs them up even more. So with meditation, best case scenario, you'll meditate and fall back to sleep. Worst case scenario, at least you're resting and conserving your energy. So to change the topic a little bit, I know you've been teaching and practicing meditation for many years and I'm just wondering how has the meditation scene changed in that time? If you've noticed any sort of fads or any trends? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So what I've seen since the 1990s is that meditation has shifted in the way that it's been promoted. So back in the 1990s there was this idea of meditation being all about magic and miracles. It was this exotic thing that was far, far away. But it's become a lot more practical since then. And part of that has been because of the interest shown by psychologists and medical science. So if you like, there's now evidence-based meditation. People are able to look at MRI scans and say, okay, I meditate because I want to create this kind of brain activity. And so people who were skeptical about the magic and miracles kind of meditation are much more comfortable with a secular approach. What do you think about technologies like, say, the Muse headset that tie in with meditation and are said to help people attain that state of mind. Yeah, it's one that I would like to try. It's pretty expensive, so I haven't tried it yet, but... I've got one. Yeah, you have got <laughs> Bring it on. Yeah, like um, meditation technology, <laughs> intersection of Ron's favourite things. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess uh, what occurs to me is that, you know, in 1975, Herbert Benson published The Relaxation Response, and in his book, he looked at meditators' EEG results. And there he was talking about beta brainwaves, alpha brainwaves, theta brainwaves, and delta brainwaves. So I guess that Muse or, or similar technologies are able to monitor those brainwaves and say, OK, you're in alpha. And then as a trained meditator, you're able to recognize what that state feels like and kind of hold yourself there for longish periods of time. But without trying it, I'm just guessing that that's what it does. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. I guess as well as that, it's got an app that goes along with it <clears throat> and it sort of gamifies it in a way, if that makes sense. So if you're having a good streak of, um, I guess, alpha waves, it will sort of send these birds you know, so you will hear birds <laughs> next to you and if your brain gets a little bit more active it will start sounding windy and some thunderclouds coming oh, yeah. <laughs> which I, I've noticed can actually that can sort of spiral you off a bit more because you're like oh no the thunder's coming <laughs> um, but yeah no it's, it's, it's really quite interesting what I found annoying or not helpful about the news is you have to do a count Mm -hmm. and that's not my usual practice okay. mm -hmm. so I found it kind of a little bit annoying 
to have to count. Mm. And I found that my brain was sneaky enough that I could be doing the count, but I could also think about something else, <laughs> like, how, oh, this count's not working for me. This is not how I meditate. They have actually introduced different um, different teachers. Ah, I'll have another go. Yeah, yeah. 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 I haven't used it for a little while, to be honest. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I guess the other thing is, you know, some of these trends and, and fads that have come up over the years, and I may have just mentioned one, but uh, I wonder if any of them have sort of left you scratching your head a little bit. One thing is that sometimes people think of mindfulness meditation as a brand. So, for example, with transcendental meditation, I think that is a brand you know it does lend itself to say okay well there's a particular approach and this is what you do whereas mindfulness meditation is a much broader category it can include a whole lot of different approaches so i guess i wish people would devote a little more time to their choices in terms of doing a bit of research before making a decision about which way to go, which way to jump. Have you got any helpful resources? Like if someone is thinking, okay, I think maybe I do need a bit of meditation in my life, how do I choose the technique that's going to be right for me? One suggestion would be to ask some questions of some teachers. And so people could, for example, go to the Meditation Association of Australia website and find a listing of teachers there. There are hundreds of teachers who are members of that organisation in Australia. Even Wikipedia will give you some quite good information about meditation and there are several free apps where you can try thousands of different guided meditations. So now it comes down to how do you choose which one? You know, now there's so much information out there about meditation. How do you work out which way to go and part of that might come down to the level of experience of the teacher and just finding an approach that resonates with you so some people will want a particular path you know they want to sign up for a particular school of thought and pursue that and kind of drill down into that experience other people value more of a diversity and so they might like an approach where it's more versatile and there's more than one practice that you do. So I guess you have to ask yourself those questions of what kind of person am I? What might work for me? But part of it might be asking the question, what do you love? What naturally holds your interest? Mm. And then finding an approach that's in line with that. So people who love music might find that music meditation is an excellent doorway for them into meditation. People who have a really high quality of body awareness, so for example people who practice a lot of yoga, they might like to explore that avenue. Uh, mindfulness of body, yoga nidra, practices like that. There's so many approaches to meditation and sometimes meditation can be spontaneous and natural. So if you look back on your own life and your own experience, maybe recall a time where you felt relaxed but also clear-minded at the same time. What were you doing when you experienced that state? And that might be a, a doorway for you to explore. An interesting thing about meditation as well is I've heard numerous people choose a meditation teacher because they like their voice. <laughs> <laughs> That works for you? Yeah. It is important, you know. Yeah. It's kind of like, okay, I'm going to be spending some time learning something from a person. What do I think of that person, you know? Is this a person that I want to spend some time with or is this a person that, that I don't want to spend some time with? <laughs> and so if you like their voice, if you like how they are with other people, then those are, are good signs. So this is a often asked question by new to new meditation people. How many times do I need to practice to get benefits? So it really varies from person to person and it depends what kinds of benefits you're looking for. 
Oh, enlightenment, obviously. <laughs> okay, that might take a while. <laughs> or it might be instant. <laughs> I guess I would start with more mundane benefits. So, to me, if you attend to your experience during meditation, then you might notice benefits as they occur. So, for example, if you notice that your body feels more loose or comfortable during meditation than it did before, that's a benefit. If you notice that you're needing to swallow more or your stomach is gurgling, then your digestion is becoming more active, that's a benefit. So looking out for some of these signs of relaxation give you pretty much instant feedback that you're changing your body chemistry for the better. Mentally, if you notice that you're not so much thinking about what's just happened and what's just about to happen, but memories are coming through your mind from long ago, dream images or colours are coming through your mind, then those are mental signs of relaxation. So again, there's a benefit. This might be a question straight out of left field, but I was inspired to ask it. Um, do you think enlightenment is actually a thing that exists? <laughs> <laughs> well... There are people who have experienced some level of understanding and realisation that is something that some other people may not have experienced. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that I'd call it enlightenment or mm -hmm. full enlightenment because there's this idea with enlightenment that someone gets enlightened mm -hmm. and they're in that state for perpetuity, mm. you know? So if like now they've done that, everything they do from now on is all good. But there's been too many gurus gone bad mm. to demonstrate that that clearly isn't the case. You know, someone might have a particular experience in meditation, but that doesn't mean that they're going to be a wonderful person for the rest of their lives. I think sometimes enlightenment is kind of this fruit that's always out of reach and it's kind of dangled in front of you, like, yes, you can get enlightened. But then it's kind of like you reach and it just keeps getting further away. <laughs> so I wouldn't, yeah, I probably wouldn't see enlightenment as a realistic goal to be pursued in meditation. That is one of those goals that just the more you chase after it, the more it's going to be running away from you. Yeah, I guess it's, it's a definitional thing as well. So sometimes enlightenment might be called awakening or it might be called liberation. Or samadhi. Or... Yeah. And so if you think of it, say, as liberation, I think then you can maybe quantify some aspects of that. So if a person feels physically more open, more comfortable being in the world, if they feel that they're no longer holding opinions with a huge amount of rigidity and a whole lot of animosity towards people who don't hold the same opinions, then there has been a, some kind of liberation for that person. You know, they feel more liberated in themselves and they're not causing so much aggravation for other people as well. So whether that's complete liberation or partial, even partial is good. I guess as well that kind of leads to another question which is more about the health risks of meditation and the mental health risks of meditation and I know that um, some people who have different mental health issues can actually kind of go into that state where they feel like they have attained enlightenment but actually it's kind of pulled them out of reality and it's not a helpful state for their well-being. Sure. And so uh, there's, interestingly, interestingly, there's evidence of that within Buddhist teachings. So apparently the historical Buddha got enlightened under the Bodhi tree and then met up with some people that he had trained with earlier and said something like, I am the universal victor, you know, I've, I've attained enlightenment. And these people kind of looked at him and went, mm, no, nah, I don't think so, <laughs> you know. And so that sounds a little bit similar to a manic episode, you know, this idea of being very grandiose, you know, I've, I've attained universal victory. So I guess for people who 
have a tendency to to being bipolar, there can be a danger there. There are certain times of year, like Easter in particular, that can be a, a dangerous time for people with bipolar because they may become overly religious and identify too closely with the Christ figure. So coming back to the idea of are there concerns for people with mental issues practicing meditation, I think if they're practicing meditation intensively, say in a retreat situation, then it's probably counterindicated. There are certain conditions that are not suited to intensive practice because on a meditation retreat, there is quite a high level of psychological pressure. People are alone with themselves, potentially in silence for a week or 10 days, and they may get into trouble in that situation without the right support and the care of people who are experienced enough to be able to handle a difficult situation if that arises. And I've heard as well, say, for people who are quite depressed, sometimes it can just be unhelpful to be alone with your thoughts and maybe it would be more helpful to do a practice that's a little bit more physical or yeah, sure, outside. Sure. or Yeah, I mean, arg- arguably people with depression are not very physically active and so the counterbalance to that would be to do something active, whether it's walking, yoga, gardening. Those activities might actually be a better fit for that person. So meditation is not going to suit everybody and it's not going to be the cure for everything. That's sound advice. (laughs) (laughs) So to change the topic a bit, I understand you're the Vice President of Meditation Australia. Um, Would you like to talk about your role there? The Meditation Association of Australia, or Meditation Australia for short, is the national peak body for meditation teachers and for promoting meditation practice in Australia. I've been on the board now for about three and a half years and in the last couple of years my main role has been to help to organise events which are meditation related. So we recently held a three-day conference in Melbourne for teachers and so I guess my main task is raising the profile of meditation and making sure that meditation teachers get good opportunities to develop their teaching practice. We have a mutual friend, Paulie, and he mentioned to me that you sort of know pretty much everyone. (laughs) (laughs) How do you go about sort of networking with other meditation teachers? So one of the things that can happen for a lot of meditation teachers is it's this solitary pursuit, Mm. you know? So you're sitting there in silence on your own, And every now and then you might like to talk to some other people. (laughs) And so I've always reached out to other meditation teachers around the place. You know, I'm interested in what they're doing. I'm interested in who they train with and so on. And it gives an opportunity for people to learn from one another. And so part of the reason that Meditation Australia exists is to help create opportunities for meditation teachers to get to know one another and learn from one another. So have you got any events coming up that you'd like to talk about? Yeah, so there's a Meditation Australia event coming up on Sunday the 18th of November. It's with Dr Bruno Cayune, who's a clinical psychologist and meditation teacher based in Hobart, and he's going to be exploring the topic mental health first aid for meditation teachers. It's just a half-day workshop, but it's to help meditation teachers to identify if and when some of their students might need to be referred to a mental health professional, certain things to look for, and also if they're ever faced with a difficult situation, to know how to support the person in, in the difficulty that they're experiencing. 
So I guess that touches on some of the things that we were talking about with depression and with manic episodes. If you That's right. encounter something like that and you don't have any referral network or even any skills identifying if someone needs help, it's really helpful to yeah, have that's you right. know, some expert advice. That's right. I mean, one of the experiences I recall is teaching a meditation course and one of my students running out of the room. And what was happening is she was having a panic attack. And so she just had to kind of get out of there. A few minutes later, she came back in, which was really brave. You know, she obviously would have felt a bit humiliated at having done that, but she came back into the class and completed the course. So if I had no knowledge about panic attacks, I wouldn't know what was going on, you know, but I was able to reassure the rest of the people in the class that it was okay and also that the the student herself was okay to come back into the class and complete the course. Excellent. Yeah, it sounds really good. I think I'm interested in that as well. My final question, if people listening out there could just take one core thing from your teachers and everything you've learned throughout your life, what would that one thing be? Uh, I think it would be that Meditation is something that we all do already. It's not this strange, distant thing. It's really practical. And for anyone who is interested in their own thoughts, emotions, what makes them tick, then meditation is a way of exploring that. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for your (laughs) questions and, and your time. As you can hear, Paul really is a wealth of knowledge and I thank him again for speaking with us on the podcast and also for his patience. Now, our next episode is a very special one for me. It's a conversation with Michelle Lakakapis, I hope I said that right, and Simone Busia. Both these amazing individuals are living without stomachs, just like myself, and I wanted to speak with them before the No Stomach for Cancer fundraising walk that is happening on November the 18th. I'll talk more about that in our next episode, which comes out in a week. Now, we would really love to hear from you. You can join the Flow Artist community on Facebook or comment on our website at podcast.flowartist.com. Please drop us a line. The theme song is Baby Robots by Go Soul and used with permission. You can buy his music from gosoul.bandcamp.com. Joe and I will be back in one week. Thanks again. Aroha nui. Big, big love.